Okay, I'm gonna get started. Hi everybody, my name is Jesse. Um, I'm an intern for the Office of Community Engagement. Um, thank you for joining us for our first ever hybrid version of Good Neighbor Day. Um, I'm gonna just briefly show this like introduction video. Let me share my screen. Okay, let me make it big. The audio might be a little fuzzy, but I'm not really sure how to fix that. Make sure my... okay. Greetings, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Hewlett, and on behalf of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, welcome to Good Neighbor Day 2020. We have been a proud partner of Good Neighbor Day for eight years as we continue to provide healthy recreation options for our community. Each year, we look forward to joining you in rolling up our sleeves, using a little elbow grease to spruce up our community. However, just as with many events in our lives, COVID has forced us all to reevaluate, but reimagine our programming. Thanks to Good Neighbor Day, and our strong partners in the City of College Park and the University of Maryland, we can provide our residents with healthy opportunities to stay connected. We are Prince George's proud, resilient, and committed to engage in sustainable practices and pursue ways to keep our communities clean and beautiful. We are here and ready to serve. Stay safe, stay strong, Stay hopeful, look out for one another, and be a good neighbor as we work together for a hopeful future for our community. Thank you. Hi, everyone. This is Patrick Wayan, Mayor of the City of College Park. I want to thank you for joining us today and welcome you to Good Neighbor Day. This annual event takes place to beautify our shared spaces, and the City of College Park does it in partnership with the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission and the University of Maryland. Good Neighbor Day brings people together in our shared spaces to better our community and meet each other. You might be serving in your own neighborhood today, or you might discover a place in College Park that you've never been to before. It's a true measure of our community that, especially during these tough times, we come together and respond in service and partnership. So I wanna thank you for taking your time today and for taking pride in your community enough to chip in and help. I also wanna thank our partners at the University of Maryland and the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much and have a good day. Welcome to the ninth annual Good Neighbor Day, the first of its kind. This year's hybrid version of Good Neighbor Day includes virtual workshops and small scale in-person projects focused on creating and maintaining vibrant communities, as well as educating and exciting our fellow community members on a variety of topics. The University of Maryland is grateful for the Office of Community Engagement, the Prince George's County Department of Parks and Recreation, the City of College Park, and every other partner that made this, this event possible. As a land-grant university and do-good campus, through collaboration and commitment to public service, we all demonstrate what it means to be Terrapin strong. Oh and welcome to Good Neighbor Day 2020. Thank you so much for your participation. Good Neighbor Day began in 2011 when it was known as Christmas in April. We started with 50 volunteers and did home renovations. Over the nine years since, Good Neighbor Day has grown into a strong local tradition. Hundreds of volunteers have helped many in our area. We have a wonderful partnership that includes the University of Maryland, the City of College Park, and the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. This year, we have a very different kind of Good Neighbor Day with both in-person activities and online workshops. In person, we're gonna be beautifying community gardens. We're gonna be supporting lo local food banks through our food drive. And we're gonna be doing cleanups in many communities. Our online workshops include financial wellness, mental health and stress management, answering the call to justice and community involvement, 
and talking with our University of Maryland student athletes about their experiences. I want to expand, extend my heartfelt appreciation to our Office of Community Engagement for their leadership and coordination of Good Neighbor Day for many years. So thank you, Gloria, Jose, Golshan, and Cameron. Also want to thank the many planners, coordinators, and volunteers who made a commitment to Good Neighbor Day again this year. And lastly, I want to remind everybody to stay safe, exercise healthy behaviors, wear your face coverings, wash your hands, stay socially distant. And if you're not feeling well, please don't participate in person. Thank you once again. Now let's get started. Okay. Let me stop sharing my screen. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Jackie. Um, I hope everybody enjoys the workshop. And you can go, Jackie. Uh, again, my name is Jackie Fournier. I am a social worker. I am a therapist. And just to give you some background about me, um, I graduated from UMD in College Park. I got my master, um, my undergrad in psychology. Then I went to Catholic University for my master's in social work. Um, and so I've done a few different things since then. I've worked with severely chronically mental Ill, mentally ill individuals, people with like schizophrenia or um, severe bipolar disorder, things like that in a residential facility. I have worked with uh, the child welfare system. I've worked with licensing foster homes, work with the foster kids, things like that. Um, but for the past six or seven years, I've been doing therapy and now I'm in a uh, private practice. And um, I can give you, if you're interested, I can give you some more information about that later. Um, but yeah, so just to get things started. There we go. Okay, so what I'm hoping to do today is to talk to you about some of the basic mental health issues that are most common, and those are going to be like depression, anxiety, trauma, um, but then I'm also going to kind of bring the whole COVID-19 piece into it and, and really explore how the pandemic has really affected our lives um, more specifically. I'm going to talk about some coping skills. Um, that hopefully you can take with you and some tools. And at the very end, I'll give you some local resources in case you really need them. So I wanted to share this cartoon because I thought it was very accurate. Um, you know, I, I hear a lot of people, not only that, not only people that I work with, you know, the clients that I see, but even in my own personal life, um, you know, we have started out here, like this person right here has regular anxiety that he can maybe manage on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe it's not too overwhelming. He can handle it. But when you, when you start adding more and more, more balls that you're trying to juggle, it just feels overwhelming, right? Add on top of it, COVID anxiety, then election anxiety, then seasonal depression, more existential issues that you're worrying about. And suddenly it just seems overwhelming. And the ways that we typically cope for a lot of us, um, those ways kind of are gone or they've been shifted or um, our supports aren't there. And so, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are struggling. And if you personally are not really struggling, I guarantee that you know somebody who is. So like I said, I'm going to start with some of just some of the basic information about depression, anxiety, and trauma. Although I do want to kind of go through those things quickly because I feel like most of us have a basic understanding of at least depression, anxiety. Um, but just for information, let me move my little screen there. Um, but just for some basic information. So depression, uh, the DSM, which is the diagnostic manual that we use for diagnosing people, diagnosing people. Um, I'm not quoting it, but I'm just giving kind of the basics of like what criteria um, is in there to meet, to meet a, a di depression diagnosis. Um, so in there you would see mood disorders, major depressive disorder, 
um, persistent depressive disorders. So symptoms last over a period of at least two weeks. They could be mild to, to severe. They can occur a, you know, a one-time thing or it can be recurrent, um, but it is much more than just feeling sad. And I feel like depression, the word gets kind of thrown around a lot. Um, but really it's, it's not just being sad about something. It's not just being annoyed about something. Depression really affects your daily functioning. Um, so symptoms of depression, you know, most of us know irritability, mood swings, feeling sad, hopeless, or worthless. It can affect your sleeping and eating patterns. It can cause us to lose interest in our personal hobbies. Sometimes we isolate ourselves from others. Sometimes we can't maintain hygiene or get out of bed. Um, it can impact your uh, concentration and memory. Um, and, that, and also it can le lead to suicidal thoughts or actions. Um, and, you know, and depression can look very different for different people. You know, um, sometimes it's not just crying all day, every day. Sometimes it's severe ir irritability and anger. Um, and so um, sometimes I think if, if you're not aware of the variety of different symptoms, uh, you might not even realize that you have depression. All right, so I have here Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm not sure how many people have ever heard of this, um, but I talk a lot with the clients I see about needs. Um, and I think it brings up a lot of good conversation and people get a lot of good insight when we focus the conversation around needs and what's being met and what needs are not being met. So I just put this here just so that maybe you can get some insight. Um, if I look at this big pyramid here, um, so if we start at the bottom, that's kind of the foundation, that's kind of the base of the things that we need to survive. So we have food, water, um, shelter, things like that. And as you kind of go up that ladder towards the top, you're getting things that maybe you don't need to survive, but they really help you to be, to, to live your full potential basically, um, and feel good and happy about your life and about yourself. And so in general, having unmet needs can result in a lot of significant emotional distress and can cause depression or anxiety. And right now with COVID, so many of us are not getting our needs met. Um, you know, and if you have lost a job, if you um, are un under financial strain, if you can't afford the food that you need um, or to take care of your family, then you're not meeting those basic needs towards the bottom. So how can you really even start to address um, the more emotional, uh, or existential needs towards the top, you know? Um, and so what I've had to do with my clients is get really creative um, about how we can get those needs met. Uh, but the idea of needs is gonna be something that we kind of revisit throughout this presentation. And, you know, and I meant to say um, earlier, you know, I'm not sure kind of who my audience is exactly. So I don't know if most of you are college students or if you're members of the community. Um, so I'm gonna try to apply all these things kind of to a broad range of people. But you know, if you're college students, I might be talking a lot about work or family life or things like that. Um, but hopefully you can still find ways to apply it to yourself. So the most common un unmet emotional needs that I've been hearing at least from people is the social isolation and loneliness. Um, and then also there's been a lot of discussion about a lack of hope for the future. Um, and that's because we have all these questions that we don't have answers to. Like when is COVID gonna end? What's the future gonna look like? Um, I'm sure there's gonna be some sort of new normal. You know, I expect that a lot of the virtual um, meetings and socializing that we've been doing, is not gonna completely go away. You know, I think it'll still be here. Um, and so, yeah, so if we have this hopelessness about what our future is gonna look like, um, then, then it could really cause people to start considering suicide, especially if you're missing a social support. So um, some treatment and interventions for depression. 
um, I work with people on journaling and journaling, you know, it does not have to mean a very, this very daunting, overwhelming, time consuming task. It doesn't have to be writing 10 pages in your diary every night. It could simply be bullet points and taking a few notes every day. Uh, it could really help you to get thoughts out and just kind of to kind of clarify or gain insight into what you've been thinking about. And sometimes if you have a lot of like racing thoughts or kind of, um, you know, if you can't turn your brain off at night, sometimes it helps people with sleeping if they can get things out of their brain and they can just mentally rest. Um, so journaling can be really, really helpful for that. I work with people on building self-esteem, um, doing positive affirmations, telling themselves good things about themselves. Um, you know, if you are someone who has a lot of trauma in their past, processing childhood or past experiences um, is a big part of, of, you know, working through that depression. Building a support system, setting boundaries with yourself and with others, those are all things that you can work on to kind of battle some of the depression. Um, and then we also have meeting needs, like I talked about, and medications. And I am not a doctor, psychiatrist, nurse practitioner. So I am not an expert on medication uh, for depression, but just some, some basic information. You'll see terms like SSRIs or MAOIs. These are things that, um, you know, kind of alter different, um, di different uh, chemicals in the brain, things like that, to kind of help us with the depression. Um, most of you have probably heard of Zoloft or Prozac. Uh, I think ketamine is like, a, I think a rather new treatment medication for depression. I, I believe it's been really effective. So moving on to anxiety, again, the DSM says um, for general anxiety disorder, you'll see persistent and uncontrollable worry. It lasts for six months or more, and it's about a broad range of things. Now, if you are having anxiety about a very specific thing, that's maybe more likely a phobia, um, or if you're having panic attacks that are really affecting you physically, um, that could be panic disorder, something like that. Anxiety and depression often go hand in hand, so a lot of people will have both at the same time, um, so that can seem very daunting. And, um, and anxiety can really, really phys uh, impact our physical health. I took, I took a, a training about a year ago on the brain gut connection. And it was so interesting. Apparently there is this, this nerve called the vagus nerve, I believe that connects the brain to the stomach. And so when you hear terms that, you know, we're used to hearing, I have a pit in my stomach, I have butterflies in my stomach. Um, it really is because our emotional brain is tied to the rest of our body. Um, you know, or some people will get stomach ulcers if they have too much anxiety and worry and stress. So again, you probably all know this, but symptoms of anxiety, overwhelming nervousness, uh, worrying all the time. And oftentimes it's about things that you know, you don't really need to worry about, but your emotional brain cannot convince your logical brain that, that you don't, or your, sorry, your logical brain just can't convince your emotional brain that you don't have to worry about it because it feels very real. So you might not be able to stay focused. It might impact your social life, especially if you have social phobia. Um, again, physi physiological changes. So when you, if you have a panic attack, you're gonna have heart, your heart rate's gonna go fast. You're gonna sweat. You, you might not be able to breathe deeply, things like that. Um, and again, trouble with sleeping and eating. So a lot of our anxiety now is because we have, we have fears. We have fears of the unknown. Um, again, what's the future gonna look like? We don't know. Is, do, am I gonna have a stable job? Am I ever gonna return in person to school? We don't, you know, we don't know the answers. Um, and fear of the pandemic itself. So, we don't feel comfortable with our physical safety. We might be afraid, be afraid to be around other people. Even if we're not afraid specifically to get it, we might be afraid of passing it along to people we love who, who could really suffer. 
Uh, so treatment and coping skills for anxiety. I work with people on grounding techniques, which is basically you're trying to bring yourself back to reality, back to the moment, to be very present, to, to kind of get out of your, your, your kind of swirling, spinning, uncontrollable, anxious thoughts. You're trying to be more present and mindful. Um, so people might, you know, people might focus on their senses. You know, you might try to um, listen to some soothing music or touch something that's, that's very comforting to you or um, what, like look at a, something very pleasant uh, just to try to calm yourself down and get out of your head. You can do some deep breathing. You can do meditation, which again, just like, you know, just like I was talking about before, like journaling, like it doesn't, meditation does not have to be this hour long daily, um, big daunting task. You can get an app on your phone. There's something called Headspace, I believe. I've heard good things about, um, you know, and it just helps you um, to, to start practicing some meditation. And it could, you could start at five minutes and that would be fine. And it's something that you have to work on to get better. So don't get discouraged if it's difficult in the beginning. Uh, mandalas, I will talk about in the next slide. Uh, and again, mo medications overlap a lot with depression meds. You've heard of things like Xanax and Valium. Those are sedatives. And then I also put on here cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, if you've heard of it, they probably, they call it CBT. And that helps to challenge and get rid of irrational or unhealthy thoughts. Um, and so basically you had this, you had two theories that they put together. So cognitive theory focuses on, on our brains and our thoughts and behavioral theory is like Pavlov's dog. It's like classical conditioning, things like that. So they put it, put it together with the idea that if we can change our thoughts, our irrational, unhealthy thought patterns, we can have healthier emotions and behaviors and we'll be able to live more effective, healthier lives. So the Sam Mandela's, um, over the last few years, I think adult coloring books have gotten really popular and it, it kind of, I think, stems from this. So the, um, so, you know, I don't know all the history, but monks would make these big, these big intricate pictures with sand, colored sand. And so I don't know if this picture actually is, it's kind of hard to see, but so what they would do is like, some of them would be as big as a, like a room and over weeks or even months, they would create these detailed pictures with colored sand. And really the idea is to, you know, you have to put a lot of focus into them um, and, you know, they would finish them and then right away, they would blow them away, get rid of it, which seems crazy because you just put all this work into this beautiful thing. But the idea is that, well, it served its purpose. You know, you spent that time being mindful, really focusing, you know, being calm and, and, and it, it served its purpose. And now things change, things move on. And so kind of getting used to, you don't have to hold on to this. We can move on and start over. And so you can find mandalas online. You can find them in coloring books. You can find them online and print them off. And, you know, for people who have a lot of anxiety, they say that it really helps to be able to kind of sit there and be able to focus and get, you know, get away from those thoughts that are overwhelming you and be able to just be mindful on this thing that you really have to focus on. And so maybe it's something that you want to look into. And, and by the way, most of the stuff that I'm going to be showing on here, like worksheets or pictures or things like that, you can find online. All of these things I Googled and found online. Uh, you do not need to go see a therapist to get some of these worksheets and things. And so, so like this, this thought record. So I'll do something similar like this with my clients. If you um, are having a lot of irrational or unhealthy thoughts, something like this thought record will really help you analyze that thought to see, well, is this really realistic or am I catastrophizing? Am I um, thinking about things irrationally? 
So, you know, just for an example, let's say, let's say a guy walks into work and his boss is screaming and yelling at him. And so his automatic thoughts are going to be, oh, I'm, not, I'm no good at my job. I can't do anything right. I'm such a failure. You know, he has these negative thought patterns and core beliefs about himself. And then maybe he says, okay, well, I'm just going to quit my job. And then later comes to find out, well, actually his boss wasn't mad at him. His boss had something personal going on and, you know, it had nothing to do with him. And maybe he is really good at his job, but if he has these core beliefs about himself that he can't get past, he might do things in his life that are just not good for him. And he, not, he, he doesn't feel good and he's not going to live a happy life. So things like this thought record, thought logs can really help you kind of gain awareness and see what can I do to challenge and change these patterns. Now, trauma is maybe a little bit less um, familiar for a lot of people than anxiety and depression. So uh, trauma used to be lumped into the anxiety section of the diagnostic manual. Um, now it has its own section um, because it, it is very, it, they have similar similarities, but there are also a lot of differences. Um, so trauma happens as a result of an event that causes extreme emotional distress, like a car accident, any kind of abuse, going to war, um, some, of the most stressful situations people go through that are, are pretty common are losing a loved one, losing a job, going through a divorce, things like that. So even those, those kind of smaller, less obvious things can still be considered tra traumatic for people, you know? Um, so with PTSD, um, that the symptoms last for more than a month. Um, there is something called acute stress disorder that I put up earlier, but that is more of like an, an immediate reaction to a really traumatic event. Usually it doesn't last as long, but PTSD is a very, is a lot more long-term for a lot of people. And I think it's important to note that we all respond differently to trauma. So something that impacts me and feels traumatic for me might not for you, even though we're going, maybe got, gone through the same thing. Um, but, but what I'm feeling is still valid, even if you don't process it the same way. So symptoms of trauma can be nightmares, uh, not sleeping, depression, and anxiety are big ones. You could have flashbacks. Uh, you could have triggers that, that affect you physically, kind of like the, the panic attack sort of. Um, a trigger could be a sound, a smell, a song, you know, something that takes you back to that time that you're going through that trauma. You could have intrusive thoughts. So you could be totally fine um, having a conversation with a friend, be totally fine. And then suddenly a really disturbing thought pops up in your head and you can't get, can't get it out of there. So COVID-19 is very unique in that I believe it, it feels like a collective trauma, you know, and that is referring to an event that traumatizes an entire group of people. And in this case, it's the whole world. So we are all going through this together. And maybe somebody who is managing pretty fine, maybe their life hasn't really changed as a result of COVID. Um, maybe they don't see it really as a trauma, but I think in general, all of us, it's, it, it's such a, you know, it's such a unique thing that no one in our generation has ever gone through that, you know, I think we can agree for most people, this feels a little traumatic in some way. Um, and it, I think also it's important to say that some groups may feel more, more affected than others. So like I said, if, you're, if your job situation hasn't changed, if your social situation hasn't changed, it might not feel traumatic, but for a lot of us who have you know, for, for people who are in marginalized groups, who are uh, not financially stable, or don't have access to healthcare, um, they're really feeling it. Uh, some other things going on that can make this time period feel traumatic is all, is all the social injustice that's been going on, you know, um, especially if you are part of the 
you know, part of the, the, the group of people who feel like you're, you're on the end of it, really feeling it, you know, all the police brutality, things like that. Um, even if you are not experiencing directly the police brutality, if you feel like your community is, then it, it can feel traumatic. Your safety may feel at risk. Politics, um, you know, it's funny that this training came right on today, um, but, you know, a lot of us had been feeling anxious with the election and even the past couple of days since we didn't know anything. Um, a lot of people are wondering how this election is going to impact our life. And then environmental factors, you know, global, global warming, things on a larger scale. These are all things that, that really impact our mental health as well. And the transitions. So like I said, for most of us, we've had some sort of transition to make, whether that be school and work being at home or at least having to change those hours. Maybe you're unemployed now, maybe you have to be on a job hunt, maybe you have to become a teacher for your children. Um, you know, and that's a new role for you and you're trying to balance being present to guide your child through school while also trying to maintain work, while also trying to maintain all, you know, all these other things. And then the transition of how do I maintain a social life or, or a support system virtually? Because it just feels different doing it all virtually. So, you know, just kind of to wrap up trauma a little bit, how is it, how's trauma different than general anxiety disorders? Well, for trauma, uh, the worries are, it's a more based in reality. I mean, I, you know, I want to validate everybody who has any kind of anxiety. And so for people who are gen have general anxiety disorder, even though it might be things that maybe your logical brain is saying, these, the, you don't need to worry about these things. They're not really going to happen, but it feels real, right? So, you know, I validate anyone that, that goes through that. But, but trauma, trauma is a little bit different because it has actually happened to someone, right? So you can't say to someone who's gone through abuse, that'll never happen to you. Don't worry about it because it has. So, um, and then in what ways is the pandemic a trauma? Again, extremely difficult transitions. Our lives are turned upside down seemingly overnight. And it is kind of like going through a grief process because we're grieving the lives that we used to live for a lot of us. Treatments for trauma, there is something called EMDR and I'm not an expert in it, but it is, um, it's supposed to be very, um, very helpful. And it, it actually, you have to find someone who's trained in it and certified in it. Not any therapist can do this, uh, but it's, it basically has to do with the movement of your eye and the therapist might use their finger and you follow the finger with your eyes, or there might be like a light that you follow back and forth. Um, and my understanding is that by processing your trauma and, and you're guided and led and, and you are asked specific questions about your trauma and you, you kind of process it while you're also working with those eye movements and somehow it's supposed to kind of rewire parts of your brain in a way, um, but you can look into that more because I am not, like I said, an expert, uh, but you can do trauma-focused therapy and again, medications that overlap with depression. Because like I said, depression, anxiety are big pieces often for people who have trauma. So here are some of the, the major ways our lives are being affected right now by COVID. Our relationships, our family dynamics, our physical health, work and school changes. So like our daily schedule and routines are upended. And like in the, the first picture I showed you, the ability to manage pre-existing mental health issues feels overwhelming sometimes. So with peer relationships, again, physical limitations, we can't be one-on-one -on -one with each other. Well, I, mean, I know, a lot of people do. I know a lot of people have different views on what they feel is safe to do and not safe to do. So maybe there are some of us who do feel okay being face-to-face. -face. Um, a lot of us don't. And so the physical limitation is hard. 
Um, and a lot of us, I think, have lost the mental energy to engage. So even though I could be doing maybe happy hours every night virtually if I wanted to, you have the virtual fatigue. And it's like, you know what, if I'm on the computer virtually doing meetings all day, I really just don't, don't want to do it again at night, for example, maybe. And it just feels, the dynamic is different. It just feels different. With family dynamics, you know, you might have someone who used to be able to manage their mental health issues by going out and getting their needs met um, and finding their social supports, um, but staying at home, maybe their home, their home environment is, is actually pretty toxic maybe their home environment is more stressful. And so being stuck at home uh, in close quarters with people who are unhealthy for you, uh, that makes it way more difficult to manage any mental health issues that, that were before kind of manageable. I mean, the opposite could be true too, right? So you could have a family or a marriage or roommates, you know, you could have these dy dynamics of people who weren't that close before, but now that they've been stuck together so much, they've had so much quality time together that maybe their relationships got stronger and that would be great. So maybe that's a silver lining. Physical health, uh, you know, a lot of us aren't going to the gym anymore. A lot of us are working from home or doing school from home. So we're, we're sitting around not getting as much exercise. We're avoiding doctor's offices because why put yourself at more risk going to a doctor's office, right? So, and again, our bodies and minds are so closely linked. So if you feel physically unhealthy, there's a good chance that maybe your, your brain, your emotional, your mental state will too. So with work and school, for most of us, since everything's at home, we don't have any boundaries or transitions. And I know for a lot of people, you know, that transition between home and school or home and work, um, it helped us to kind of separate things. And, and now that we don't have that, you know, a lot of people that come in, to, you know, virtually come in and see me, um, you know, they say, you know, I feel like I'm not doing enough at work but no one's been getting on that. No bosses are yelling at them, but they feel like they're not doing enough because, well, home is work now and I'm always home. So shouldn't I always be working? And if I'm not, I feel guilty about that. Or the opposite, um, maybe, they're, maybe they're working all the time and they don't know, there's nothing signifying to them that there's a transition into your home life because it's all the same. Or the opposite could be true that if you are one of the people that has to still go out to work or has to, to still go out to school, suddenly you're, you're forced to choose between your financial security or your physical safety, and that might not feel good for you. So again, so you could have a variety of pre-existing mental health conditions that you started with before all this happened, um, but now you're less able to cope with them because you don't have your social supports, you don't have your routine, you don't have your boundaries and transitions and all those things. Um, you could have childhood trauma um, that, that you are going through. You could have mental illness, you, you know, all of these things. And it's really tricky to try to figure out how do you get your needs met? How do you balance it? And how do you address these mental health issues? Um, now that you have all these other things that you have to worry about. So what can we do about it? We can develop coping skills, implement self-care. You can engage in therapy. So I wish, I wish this were a little bit more interactive so I can ask you guys what you feel like your coping skills are, like what you guys do when you need to cope with something difficult. Um, maybe we can do that at the end if we have time for questions and answers. But so some of the things that I work with people on Again, journaling, I already talked about meditation, talked about deep breathing, grounding techniques. So I have here, and I'm not gonna read through it, but it's just one example of a, like a, a breathing exercise. Um, and again, you can find all of this stuff if you Google it and you can find different ones. 
This one is, for example, three minutes. You might find one that's 15 minutes. You could try different ones and, and see whatever works for you. Um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do 10 minutes. You don't have to do 15. You don't, whatever works for you. What works for you might not work for someone else, but that's fine. Whatever helps you. So self-care, I feel is another word that's kind of, it's been familiar, I think, for a lot of us for a while. People talk about this a lot. And, and I think the first thought that might come up in your mind would be like a glass of wine and taking a bubble bath. And sure, that can be self-care. You know, you can have some relaxation time and indulge yourself. Um, but self-care can look very different depending on what you need to feel like you're living a healthier life. So for some people that might be making a routine, you know, with COVID, working from home, school from home, it is hard for a lot of people to get motivated and have that self-discipline to do what they need to do. So making a routine could be considered self-care if it helps them function during their day. Taking a break, positive self-talk, setting realistic expectations. You know, if you have a boss that's asking you to do too much and you just can't balance it all, can you say no? Exercising, socializing, chill and watch Netflix, set boundaries. Boundaries are a big self-care um, tactic that people don't really realize as self-care, but sometimes if you, if you need to set boundaries with somebody, that can really help you, um, that can help your relationship be healthier that can help you live a healthier daily life. Um, and again, because all of these areas are kind of enmeshed right now. Therapy, you can engage in therapy. Um, I really like this picture here of, of therapy. Um, you know, a lot of people think, well, what am I gonna get out of just talking to somebody? But it really helps to kind of process everything that's going on. And maybe if you or if you're someone who has anxiety and all your thoughts are racing and, and you have these patterns and intrusive thoughts and you just can't get out of your head sometimes, it helps to get it all out. And the therapist kind of rolls it up together in these nice little categories and, and can kind of just objective, objectively kind of like piece it all together um, in a way that makes more sense and you can gain insight. Um, so again, CBT, you can kind of challenge those unhealthy thought processes. You can evaluate needs. You can um, get on medication if you feel like you need it. So here, again, we already went over this, the CBT thought log, things like that, because um, the negative core beliefs can really hold us back from living healthy lives. This is a list uh, that I use sometimes with clients, and it's just a list of human needs. You can find a lot of different ones if you Google it. But it's interesting how this, this one list, when I give it to people, it can spark so many lengthy conversation and I get so much insight and information from people. And I think they really start thinking about their lives in a different way. Because nobody, we often don't say like, hmm, I wonder what needs I'm miss missing right now. I wonder how my behaviors are really um, showing me what it is I'm trying to get, you know? So oftentimes I'll just give this list to people, ask them to maybe circle a few that really stand out. And somehow that kind of opens up a floodgate, you know, because they're thinking about how these words apply to their life. And maybe these are needs that, that are met, maybe they're needs that are not met. And then we, I start to ask them, okay, well, how are we, for these needs that are not met and that's making you very unhappy or it's leading to unhealthy behaviors, how can we get those needs melt, met in a healthy way? So again, what needs are most important? Which ones are met? Which ones are not? How can you get them filled? Now for medication, um, I feel like I'm not really, I'm not like a pill pusher. Um, it is appropriate for some people and not for everybody. 
oftentimes people get discouraged quickly um, if something doesn't work for them, but it is sort of a trial and error situation. You have to see, you know, which medication works, which doesn't, what dosage works, what doesn't. You know, and there are some people who really can utilize uh, medication as a stepping stone so that they can function well enough to utilize the tools they learn in therapy. So some good news about all this, what we can do, you know, cause COVID right now, it's like this time where we feel like we have lost control of what is normal and what we can do and can't do. Um, a lot of people say they just feel like they don't have control, but you know, like I've said, there are things that we can do. You know, we can implement coping skills. We can go to therapy if we need it. Uh, we can gain awareness and insight to help us through it, like thinking about your needs. We can, um, we can reframe, use reframing to look at things through a new lens. And that's why I chose this picture of the camera, right? Because some people can look at this, this picture and just see scribbles and it means nothing. And then other people can look at it and see a camera. So that's kind of an example of reframing. Um, so it's kind of... You know, if you are someone who is stuck in these negative thought patterns, you're often just going to view at everything as negative. But we can work on reframing things to view every situation in a different way. Because similar to trauma, how, how maybe something that traumatizes you might not traumatize me, but that's because everyone looks at things differently. Um, often the hardships help us to grow, right? We become resilient. We develop skills and tools to get through this that we can use next time we get into a hard situation. And we're all going through this together, you know? Um, so in a way, hopefully this kind of normalizes things. You know, if you're one of the people that's having an emotionally, mentally really difficult time through this, just know a ton of people are, most people are too. It might look a little different. It might be a little different for everybody because we're all going through this in our own unique way. But, but this is kind of, again, a collective trauma. So again, we are not alone. Uh, so I wanted to leave you with some local resources. Uh, Choice Clinical Services, that's the agency I work for. It's private practice. Um, mental health therapy. Um, if you wanted more information, you can look, look us up. I should have put the website on here. It's www.choiceclinical.com. Um, also, if there's anything from this presentation that you wanted or you had questions personally for me, you could always email me. I, again, I should have put my information here, but um, you can find me on the Choice Clinical website or my email is jacqueline.fournier at choiceclinical.com. So you have uh, the City of College Park Youth and Family Services Program. You have Greenbelt Cares. Um, if you're a student on campus, um, I'm told the Psychology Clinic, I think they offer a sliding scale fee for services. Um, again, online worksheets. You can find most stuff online. If you need help with boundary settings, you can Google boundary setting work worksheets or therapy boundary sheets worksheets um, you just need to know kind of what to look for and you'll find them um, the maxwell foundation i think they help people to find the mental health services they're in i think they're based out of Greenbelt, and i think they're rel relatively new shepherd shepherd pratt that um that is a facility that if someone needed, if someone came to my agency and it turned out once a week therapy sessions was just not enough for them, they really needed something more, um, more intensive, I might refer them to Shepherd Pratt. They have like, I think a couple locations in the larger area um, for inpatient or out, you know, intensive outpatient services. And then I have for you some hotlines. I believe they're both 24 seven, National Suicide Prevention Hotline and the PG County Crisis Hotline that if you are really, really in need 
um, they are they are there um, as a support. Okay. So I don't even know how we're doing on time, but you know, I kind of ran through it as quick as I could to make sure we had time for any questions that there might be. Um, so let me try to stop sharing. Okay. I'm not sure if anybody has questions. I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself or what, but you know, I'm open if you have anything else to talk about. And hopefully everyone got something out of this. Hopefully it didn't bore you to death. Um, but, you know, I hope you just got at least a little bit of insight or knowledge or, you know, just made you think more about how we're viewing this period of time. Okay, yeah, so you can also ask questions in the chat if you can't unmute or don't want to unmute. Okay, yeah, dropping my email. Okay, I'm gonna send my email so everyone has it if they want it. Hey, I do have a quick question. Yes. Um, do you all offer services um, in, in Spanish? Um, I know we used to have a bilingual therapist on our staff. Uh, she's not with us anymore. I'm not positive. There may be one or two therapists who do speak Spanish, um, but definitely, you know, if anyone needs that, reach out to us. Um, the um, our receptionist would know for sure who'd be able to do that. And then is everything, do you all just um, take people with insurance or do you do a sliding scale? So we accept Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, we accept Aetna and Cigna. And we do have a sliding scale that we can offer as well. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh, and do, um, for your population, is it mostly adults or do you all also take children or what are the ages? Yeah. So we, I would say definitely mostly we have adults coming in to see us, but we do, I mean, we accept kids, we accept couples, um, you know, we'll do family work. Um, I will say not every single therapist will work with kids, not every single therapist will do couples, but we do have people that do that. Um, the biggest question is, do they have openings? Because, um, you know, with COVID, we've had you know, we've had a lot of people calling up, which I mean, it's good that they're reaching out, but um, we've gotten pretty busy. But so, you know, I really encourage everyone to um, to reach out if they're interested in services. Yeah. And but all the services right now are virtual. Yes. Yes. And I really, I have no idea when we would be going back into to the office to do face-to-face. -face. I mean, I, I imagine it'll be quite some time. I know our, the owner of our agency is not interested in, at all in putting anyone at risk if they don't need to be. And virtually, you know, it's not ideal. I would much rather be face-to-face -face with my clients, but it works and it keeps everyone safe. So that's what we're doing for now. Do you have any, um, and sorry, you can also stop me if I'm asking too many questions. No, no, it's fine. Um, but do you have any, uh, so one of the things, uh, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Maryland. So I usually tend to like buy workbooks or work or tell my clients to buy workbooks mm -hmm. on mindfulness or CBT. Do you have any workbooks or coloring books that you have found successful or have found that your clients have been more receptive to? Um. For specific therapy workbooks, no, I feel like I get, you know, our office is pretty good at like sharing, like we, we all share amongst each other, like, oh, this worksheet is good, that worksheet is good, or I, like, honestly, I do just Google, because I feel like if I can find it easily, then that means my client can find it easily, and so if, you know, if, if it works, um, 
for people, I'll just kind of, you know, if I need to alter things or whatever, I'll, I'll like make it apply and fit. If I find something, I'll just like kind of try to apply it for whatever my ther uh, my client's going through at the time. Um, there was a, there's a good CBT book. It's kind of old now. I think it's called Feeling Good. Um, you know, a good book that's out there right now is uh, Permission to Feel. Um, okay. That's a really good book. So if anybody, it, it, it and then the other one is um, uh, The Body Keeps the Score. And it really talks about trauma. And then the other book talks a lot yes. about um, just kind of like, how you allow yourself to feel because sometimes we don't feel like we have permission to feel. So um, he does a really great job of like just opening that up for people to really express themselves in that manner. So if anybody's interested, permission to feel and then the other yeah. one, the body keeps the score. Yeah, I have heard of that one. And I've also been told um, this isn't so much therapy, like a therapy book, but I've also heard there's, there's a book called um, life is in the transitions, I think I've heard. And it, it, it basically, um, I'm told that it's really good. And it, it really talks about like, you know, how people process big life transitions differently and how, how we kind of view trans life transitions really impacts our success or, or how we aren't successful in getting through those. Um, and I think that's probably pretty um, relative or it, it really makes sense for this time period because this is a big transition for all of us yeah so yeah thank you okay thanks um okay well i guess if everyone if no one else has any questions i hope you all got something out of this and um yeah, you can contact me if you need it. And Jesse, is there anything else I need to do before we end? No, I think we're good. If no one has any more questions, um, I'll just end the meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.